Hey, this is Fraze, and it's Real Talk with George and Fraser. Today, we have a special guest. We were talking about mental health today, a topic that's really been going on a lot going on lately in the news, social media, everywhere that. And Bobby, we're going to bring in, I guess, right in now, Mr. Bobby Hallback. How you doing today, sir? Good evening. How you doing, Mr. David? How you doing? Appreciate this pretty opportunity. Pretty good, pretty good. Here. So, I'm telling you, everybody, we already butcher everybody's bio, so we let everybody do their own bio. So, okay. let's watch this up. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, I'm a mental health therapist and also a sports psychologist consultant. Uh, I've been in this field like maybe 10 years now, uh, mostly involved with uh, substance abuse. And then I transitioned over to uh, mental health and then also been able to connect with athletes based on my former experience as an athlete. And then that led me to doing sports psychology so I can help athletes deal with challenges that come with being a competitive athlete. So, you know, I uh, coach also football, basketball, and played football and basketball during high school also. And I currently work at a um, community center where we deal with uh, mental health issues, helping clients uh, overcome their uh, challenges with uh, finding a balanced lifestyle through interventions and prevention strategies and techniques. Nice. That's a mouthful. My partner always say you got a bunch of questions to ask you, so uh, <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm taking all the questions there. So, so I mean, so tell us more about the mental health issue. Whereas, is it we see more of the youth going up, or more towards the adults part of it mostly? Um, it, it depends. Like most of the time, you know, kids can have uh, challenging issues at home that can lead to issues as they continue to grow and develop. Like. Uh, limited resources, not being able to afford uh, mental health care as in growing up. And then you have individuals that may be born with their uh, mental health concerns or mental health issues like hereditary, biological factors, um, and then environmental stressors can also create onset of uh, mental illness. But it practically starts from, from, the, from childhood, adolescent, into adulthood. Um, but most of the time, it can be from the beginning of a uh, uh, childhood and then it can carry over and then once again anytime you can have a mental crisis or a mental breakdown it just also depends on your environment and your upbringing so paying to that notice you think it affects them more as they become adults if they don't have the problem taking care of their youth going up because you say a lot of events happen though some people lose their family member young um mm -hmm. you know, some people lost their parents young and raised by their grandparents do you see a difference in those kids versus kids who are actually raised by the traditional mom or dad is still in the household? Is it a differential in the mindsets or what do you mm -hmm. think? Well, in terms of that, like when we talk about the upbringing based on the family, based on the dynamics, um, if they have a kid come from a, a, a two parents household, hypothetically speaking, you would say that it is more conducive or is more safe to say that this kid should come up without any issues you know and then on the flip side of that it still can turn around and have issues you know you can be wealthy you can be rich you can be coming from a household of individuals but the silence of keeping a lot of things within can also cause a mental breakdown with the two households obviously with a single parent household you can look at it both ways you know based on the structure of that single parent how they upbring the kids and then having a support system to help nurture and develop that kid so but as in we consider the thing like when you're coming from an individual household a lot of things bad will happen or a lot of things does go wrong because it's only one parent in that household so once again it all depends on the upbringing also the environment and then the genetics um being able to have a um, clear understanding of what leads to onset of mental illness or what causes mental illness you know it can be generation curse uh based on your upbringing and also based on your genetics dna too True. Now, I'm gonna tell you basically a little bit on that genetic part of it. I know certain cultures, depending on like some person from another country versus a person from USA versus a uh, third world, let's say third world country, mm -hmm. they do you see any differential say in the mental states? Because I know some people say poverty is a way of mental health where you can't have everything you say you won't bring it up, you can't buy what you want, you can't do what you want to do, and a lot of things lead to like crime. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes mental issues where you do things you don't supposed to do, because they're like rapists, mm -hmm. uh, serial killers. Mm -hmm. I mean, all this stuff involves in mental health, and FBI usually based on their analysis mm -hmm. on those scenarios how they profile you. 
Mm-hmm. They for single, like you say, for single parent home, for a two parent home, a parent has money, parent, parent don't have money, parent has education. Like, how do you, from your perspective, mm-hmm. do you think that really plays a bigger part in that versus, or you think that maybe that it's just where they stereotype people to in order to put them in a certain category? Mm-hmm. Well, obviously, you know, based on your social social economic statuses, that does make a difference. And but at the same time, it don't exempt individuals from having mental health issues or mental health diagnosis. But having limited resources, being able to have the best of the best, or having resources that can help and promote growth. You know, when you're coming from an impoverished neighborhood, a poor neighborhood, you don't have the same access or accessibilities compare it to someone coming from a affluent neighborhood or a rich parent. So yeah, that does weigh heavy on the mind of an individual. Um, and then also as you're going from different country to different country, that's a transition. So with a transition, now you're dealing with adjustment coming from, you know, a third world country or uh, Middle East or whatever it may be coming from a, a foreign country to another foreign country. That in itself can create a lot of psychological disturbance, uh, stress, um, uncertainty, we can lead to depression, anxiety, uh, feeling overwhelmed, uh, feeling feeling um, left alone, and then also coming to a new territory. You don't know nobody. So that, that can be an onset of depression, uh, low mood, unmotivated. So, yeah, all of those plays into the factor of uh, onset of mental health concerns or mental health illness. Okay. Dang. See, I like that. I like that. I like that. <laughs> no problem. First of all, you didn't clarify which culture was it. I like that. You didn't get a, <laughs> you didn't point out a thing like it's those over there, those over there, you know? Yeah, yeah. You made it more broad, broad which is true. You now, I think some of you, you to blame culture on a lot of mental issues going on nowadays, especially in the United States, since we have so many cultures in mm-hmm. one pot and everything things differently. And I'm I mean, I've been to other countries and I'm seeing what people say here ain't always the case in their country. A lot of times people use that as a way to get into another country to seem like one place is worse than the other one, just mm-hmm. to get to another place to think it's going to be better or mm-hmm. better opportunities. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, like, so a different way to play it off. So we gonna, now we're going to turn this over to sports, my favorite topic. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Let's have it. Let's have it. <laughs> but before we go to sports, though, tell us like, some of the little tips that uh, like check uh, checks, like, uh, checklist. Some of you use checklists. Some of you use like certain things like to key points to show person who need mental help or should seek out mental help. Like you have any keys on know somebody like say like if I was had a partner and I know he had a little issue, but I can't really say he has them. But mm-hmm. in certain points I can look for to say, yeah, he may need a little help. I might have to help this boy out a little bit because he look, <laughs> I don't know. Better. I mean, I'm not saying like that. I don't, I don't think that well. But I mean, some yeah, of the help yeah. will be identified better, you know? It's just the actions, the behavior, the body language, the face expression, um, and the talks, the conversations. Like what's our what considered be at normal conversation and normal conversation. Conversations that may seem like uh, off the wall, you know, don't really make sense. Uh, just the simple things, you know, paying attention to how they how they react, how they respond to different things, and also the way they communicate and their actions and body language. That's more how you can determine, you know, by visually seeing, unless they come up and tell you, hey, man, I think something going wrong with me. I've been feeling sad for like the last two weeks, you know, and that's a problem. Like if they come to you talking about I feel, I'm feeling like self-harm and suicide or homicidal. Now, those are problems, you know, even though they may communicate that and they don't actually put it into action. But those are signs that you have to pay attention to based on their verbal expression, the body language. And the way they communicate and talk, or they may be having, you know, consuming a lot of alcohol or consuming a lot of drugs. You know, those are indicators also. Yeah, and the appetite. Yeah. Appetite, really? The appetite? I know some people have like really less appetite than the person, but I know some people like call it emotional eating. Well, that, yeah, you can do that. Like that. Too. that means you're sad. That means you're depressed. You know, so it's like if you eat more, and in, in terms of trying to suppress your feelings or deal with anger or deal with sadness sometimes individuals eat for comfort when they're feeling sad and depressed and down and then on the, then on the other side of that you know eating healthy eating good that's that's great also are you overeating too though you know 
So it's so it's like a balance, but there are measurement to kind of figure out what's going on with that individual. But the best way to understand what's happening with an individual is doing like assessment, you know, like questions based on your sleep pattern, your eating habits, you know, how you feel in the day, how long you've been feeling sad. Um, are you um, feeling suicidal or homicidal? Like, or what, what are the things that's stressing you out? How much stress can you endure? Yeah. Okay. See, that's a good point. That's a good point because I know some people seem to think that it's always the lower class or some are called middle class. But I've noticed now cases have been proven lately over in the upper class areas now where people have money and this some people are depressed. So people get more, they get um more than how they say that's another word used for it where their mindset's not the same it used to be when they were younger. They have mm -hmm. everything they have. Right, right, right. Yeah. And, and that's and that's the case. Most of them have everything from from the time they be able to walk up until up until their adulthood time. And then sometimes money don't replace, you know, what you feel, how you feel. You know, money don't bring you happiness, you know. Happiness come within yourself without the tangible things. Yeah. Exactly. See, look, good point. See, keep points again. So now we're <laughs> over to sports and your favorite subject. We know that part of there. <laughs> yeah. They're close too. So let me ask some questions that I know that's been we've been roaming around a lot. Like those like um a couple athletes now started getting more injury prone and they started getting hurt more frequently than back in the eighties, where mm -hmm. they had the same play the same way. But I know the style of play have changed. So usually the style of play changes. Their mindset also changes with the style of play. Mm -hmm. Like, say for your instance, um, a kid in our era would be a, considered way different and more aggressive mm -hmm. than a kid in this era. Mm -hmm. You know, so like, how do you differentiate to help the kids get their mindset to be able to understand to be able to play mm -hmm. at a higher level without getting so point of, I say, feeling the press. Because mm -hmm. he's not better than the next guy next to him, or mm -hmm. overdoing it to try to be better than a player next to him. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, in terms of that, the mindset is like they got to understand their why, you know, and what they're looking to give to that why when it comes to competing, like being able to identify their strength and their weaknesses as an athlete, but being more in tune to what they want to accomplish, you know, if they, if they feel like, you know, they're not as good as this player or that player, what can they do to make themselves better in terms of that? It takes the mindset of saying, okay, this is where I'm at and this is where I'm trying to go and how I'm going to build these blocks to get to a certain level, you know, and when it comes to feeling depressed as an athlete, that depression is telling you is something either that you're not doing right or it's alert, alerting you to help you understand why you're feeling depressed. What can you do to change that? So you got to identify what you're trying to do and what you're trying to become, but how you're going to become that individual that you may be looking at your teammate or this teammate or all your teammates. So it's the skill set, but understanding where you are physically and mentally, that's going to help you grow. So in terms of feeling depressed because you're not performing at a certain level, what can you do to help yourself overcome that? So then I focus on helping cli uh, clients understand, OK, let's focus on where you are now and let's talk about where you're trying to go and how you're going to get there. So if I'm if I'm not good in this area, so let's talk about what's 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 holding you back. What can you do to improve that? So you focus on the the, the deficit or the weakness and how you're going to improve that. So you put out a, a time frame or you put out a, a schedule or you put out a um in terms of the clinical setting, a treatment plan, but it goes also with saying that you got a schedule to follow. That's like when you have a training manual, like, okay, we building up. So we want to max out 250 by the next four or five weeks. So how are we going to get to those? So it's like stages with the mind, how you build a mind up to become complete, you know, in terms of a satisf satisfaction. So in terms of being satisfied, okay, we got to go from step A to step B, you know, to reach that that goal, that potential goal. So it's like the same thing as you maxing out five reps, three reps. So now we're talking about mental skills. How are we going to build our mental skills to get to that level of um, what you call it, uh, competent, where you feel competent, where you feel comfortable to go out and compete 
with the best of the best. True. I like that how you put that because I know as also been a player, there is mm-hmm. sometimes a point where you feel like, why well, I'm not starting. I'm good enough to start. I mm-hmm. should be starting. Why I'm not starting. And I know that some players like take that really personal mm-hmm. in different aspects. Like um, I said, they have my nephew. I had a nephew mm-hmm. <clears throat> went off to a school and they all take different cultures, different states, had different weird rules and one of the regulations. Mm-hmm. And we know Miami, mm-hmm. here in Florida, you play because you're the best on the field. Mm-hmm. In certain places, it's not only about the best anymore. It's about who they feel should start because of, say, he's a senior. Mm-hmm. And he needs to get more exposure. Mm-hmm. Not that he's better than you. Not that he should be starting. In fact, the matter is he's a senior. And we need to get him more exposure. So he can go either go to a different school or try to get drafted or try to get to a transfer to a better school. Mm-hmm. Like some, and he took that really hard. Like literally took it really hard because he started. They won a couple of games. He felt like he should continue to start. The coach player came back, got better off injury, and the coach immediately put him back in the game. Coach mm-hmm. didn't explain to him why he did it. He just benched him. Now you know here in Miami, they tell you why they bench you. You didn't do the job doing wrong, do too many interceptions. You know, you don't feel like I don't feel like you might start a quarterback right now. I want my old star quarterback back. But they give you some sort of explanation. Mm-hmm. They didn't give you anything. And it really broke him down mentally. Mm-hmm. Like he started turning on teammates, teammates started turning on him. The trust in a team separated because by him winning, a lot of players want to play with him. Mm-hmm. A lot of players were loyal to the older player. Right. So how right. do you like as a, as as a coach, Andrew, not as being a psychologist, fix that situation. How do you approach that situation? Well, first and foremost, the coach should have been more um, in tune to saying, okay, I'm about to make this change, and I need to make sure I'm making this change to be, make a sound decision, not just abruptly just making this change without informing the starter that was already there. Well, replace the starter, and now he came back from injury, so he should have sought down that player that replaced the injured athlete and say, hey, look, you know, I'm in the process of uh, transitioning the guy that went out on injury to come back into a starting role. So I just want to make sure I give you a heads up and I give you enough time to digest and intercept what I'm sharing with you. So when it comes to making this sudden change, but even though he made the sudden change, he should have told him up front, like, somewhere down the line, I'm going to play him back. I'm going to bring him back as he yeah. comes back from his injury reserve. So it's, it's about the coach being more upfront and being more transparent and letting the players know, like, or that particular athlete know, like, you know, this is about to happen. I just want to let you know, heads up, you ain't doing anything wrong. But at this point in time, I just want to be able to bring back the guy that was originally starting in this, in this position. And just be honest with him and acknowledge his uh, attributes, you know, before he just just tuck the player and replace them. So it is more in terms of that. And then at the same time, the player that was replaced and then the player that put in his place, it wasn't it's not up to the players to initiate that conversation. It's up to the head coach or the position coaches to hey, say, hey, look, this is about to happen. Um, Joe about to come back within a day or two or Joe ready to go. So there's no telling when I'm gonna pull Joe back in the game. Just just using the name, a name. Yeah. Um, and then just allow um, Jose to understand. Look, I appreciate what you're doing here. Um, I'm just in. The, I'm in this phase. I'm, I'm thinking about bringing Joe back. I don't know when, but it can happen anytime. So I just want to go ahead and just let you know, bring more awareness to what's about to happen. But I can't give you a certain time frame when it's gonna happen. So you give that pre-conversation before you just abruptly just take a kid and replace them without no explanation. You know, now now you got you got issues with the player that you bring it back from injury and the player that you just fastly took out the role or took away the game time. I mean, the starting time. So now you're dealing with two teammates that may obviously bump heads, get into it without the coaches being able to say, OK, let me let me abro- let me approach both of these individuals and have an individual conversation, and then you bring them together and say, this is what's going to happen. Joe, ready to go. I just don't know, know when I'm going to place him, but I just want to let you know you have, you've done a great job, and I want to be fair with you to give you a heads up. So it's more of just giving players heads up, you know, 
and giving them the heads up to say, okay, I appreciate what you have done, you know, and the time that you filled in. So giving the opportunity, you know, to acknowledge him, you know, and let him say, okay, this is how I feel, but I'm willing to sacrifice, you know? Yeah. So if you, if you don't, if you don't get that conversation or let that player be able to say and express himself, now you're building up anger, resentment, frustration. Um, I don't, I don't want to play no more. Or you, you setting off depressions, you know? Exactly. That's, that's true. That, and that's exactly what happened. He went to a stage and you know, a couple of teammates tried to help him out. And that's why I say, like, a lot of times coaches should really address that. Mm-hmm. Because the fact of the matter is, not only you messed up the person's mindset and ability to think why he wasn't, why he's not going to start anymore, mm-hmm. but you also mess up some of the mindset of the teammates who have built a community chemistry with him. Yeah. The wide receivers who used to him throwing the ball to him a certain way now. Now they got used to the guy coming back in. Have to throw the ball maybe softer than him, maybe mm-hmm. not as, as strong as him. So you, you not only did you start a conflict, you also come conflict in the chemistry of the team also, and how they perform on the field. Because I mean, you on your coach, you know, as a player, you also know. Mm-hmm. When you a wide receiver and change the quarterback, you can't catch some kind of ball. You throw lower than you, you might mm-hmm. throw higher, mm-hmm. the shorter. Mm-hmm. One guy throw right on the money. So you mm-hmm. used to catch the ball a certain way. Not saying that you shouldn't make it, be able to make adjustments, but it's harder to make adjustment at the last minute. Or a first game, or a Absolutely. first practice, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And then, as you said, it's address the whole team. Really, mm-hmm. I believe instead of just two players, and I talked to them, talk to the whole team. and said, "Look, this is what we transitioned into." Because mm-hmm. something that happened is also you may have to change the starting wide receivers. Also, yeah, of course. Or and the running backs, because mm-hmm. because that wide receiver may not want to catch the ball from this guy anymore, or mm-hmm. the guy may no, I, I ain't doing this. He may want to mm-hmm. go to the guy he loyal to this guy, mm-hmm. you know. So you got a lot of stuff that going through mindsets, and coaches take pressure also. Okay, now he got pressure now because they was winning, mm-hmm. and you know how some of them nice schools are. The first day you do that loss, you start questioning <laughs> your ability to be a coach. Yeah, absolutely, one hundred percent. So, so I mean, so now, say you get in the game, the first game, then you be they lost. Now, to you, to most people, that loss was not a big thing, but that was lost. Not no matter playoffs. Now so you did, now, yeah. So now, the alumni is mad at the coach. The coach is upset because the quarter started quarter. He thought the quarterback will get in the game probably. But like I said before, a lot of the players were still loyal to the nephew, mm-hmm. so they didn't want to play for a new guy. The other guy, he said, "We was winning. We were losing. We were starting. Why do we go back to losing when we was winning?" Who does mm. that? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Team got a taste of winning. They got a taste in the mouth. <laughs> they don't go for that sour apple no more. They don't want to touch that yeah. sour apple. <laughs> yeah, they don't yeah. want that sour apple, man. I don't want to go lose, lose. Yeah. Who want to lose it again? I don't like losing. So that caused a lot of conflict. He didn't have to lose, leave the school. So, like, how would you, like, as a professional, help that player and the coach be able to cope with this and find a solution where everybody can win from a psychology standpoint and a mindset, get a mindset right to understand what's going on right now. Mm-hmm. So let me just back it up a little bit in terms of like the player that he left or he decided yeah. not to play no more. Okay. He, started, so- he didn't want to play anymore. He just, he, he, felt, he felt that he deserved to win. Okay. He helped them win. Okay. He felt that he should not be benched because of the fact they was winning, mm-hmm. you know? And where he came from, when you win, you stay in the starting lineup. They don't right. beat you unless you mess up. Right, right. So, 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 yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Finish your statement. So his mindset, he's thinking, I didn't lose. I never, I ain't threw interception. I never fumbled the ball. I never turned over anything to give the coach any reason why I should not be starting. But only reason I think of when the player said was that the guy was senior, he had to play. Mm. So was this senior, um, I'm assuming he had some kind of leverage because he was a senior in terms of that. How was his athletic ability, his athletic access to the team? Just kind of briefly to see why. Yeah. I mean, I get it because he said a senior, yeah. so he wanted him to go out with a bang as a senior. So, well, So I get that. 
Well, apparently, because apparently, what, apparently, apparently, what it is the, the school that mm -hmm. he goes to is like one like a Juco school. Mm -hmm. And you know, Juco school have to play the have to play the seniors. Mm -hmm. You have to play the seniors in order to get to to a new school or to maybe get them to the next level, mm -hmm. right? So he not understanding that because when they went to the school, they didn't quite explain to him the culture of the school and the purpose of the school. Mm -hmm. He would think it's a regular four year school. That mm -hmm. he was thinking, you know. So mm -hmm. he was trying to figure out why to somebody had to sit down and actually explain to him that it was a Zugo's two year school, mm -hmm. and most didn't have to play because they had to get picked up by another college or mm -hmm. move to the next level. Mm -hmm. So, so it sounded like it was miscommunication from the jump start. And, exactly, and miscommunication can cause a, a ripple effect where everyone that's involved wasn't communicated clearly to to understand the system you know and how things are in place the policies and procedure so that's that's where the problem started from originated from and then it just seemed like it never got really addressed appropriately uh, down the line down the pipeline so when it came to the end the player that left because he felt like he should have stayed in the starting role without really having a clear understanding of the expectation coming to the school and then with the miscommunication led him to feel like he wasn't given a fair chance to, um, not a fair chance, but keeping him in a starting role because he didn't, he felt like he was the best player at that time, even though this was a senior over here, but it was a lack of communication where it could have been avoided to say, hey, look, with the, with the player that was doing a great job and compared with the seniors, the senior is the seniority and that should have been more explained. So without the explanation and going further into detail, like that's, that's where the original problem started from. So now that since you didn't address that, those problems, those issues, that was the turnout, the player left. And then the senior came back in because he was, he understood that senior is going to get priority no matter what type of athlete playing in front of them or how good the athlete may be. So it's really starting from the from the head top, you know, the lack of communication, miscommunication, um, no clarity and no verification. So now with that being said, and as it transpired, now you have a player leaving because he didn't really get the full understanding or the right communication to how it works, you know, in, in, in terms of class classifications and seniority, like, I, and I can understand why he got upset and left because it was a lack of communication. He knew he was better than the senior, but at the same time, the program already said that, you know, senior, senior gets seniority first. So the lack of communication and miscommunication or not clarity created that problem, created that um, separation and that division. And obviously the player left because he felt like he deserved to be in that starting role, regardless of what the senior status may be. True. That is true. And that's one of the reasons why he didn't end up leaving school. And my thing also, too, I think a lot of clarity should be clarified more mm -hmm. on what a school is versus a traditional college. Mm -hmm. You know, because mm -hmm. it's a big difference in that picture. There's a really big difference. And a lot of kids don't understand that. Mm -hmm. A lot of kids, you need to get picked up. You look like, oh, my God, a team won me. Somebody actually won me. So he, he is cited. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's asked, he's ready to go to work, you know, where to put his work in. Then you get there, you put your work in. You think we you get in this starting role, you waited, well, however long you waited to get in that mm -hmm. role, opportunity. And then somebody's like, just take, take away by the pony, like, hey, no, man, he's, you see, yeah, 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 sorry. So, I mean, me, I'm not really a fan of him. I'm not because the right matter is to me, it gave him a false a sight of being able to play as a player. And you want to win. Mm -hmm. But Jordy player want to win. Absolutely. You know? 100%. So yeah. If you're in a position to win and you're winning, most players, no matter where you're from, you can be California, New Jersey, whatever it is, they want to win. Mm -hmm. You know? And, and understanding this, if they're winning, they should be starting. You know, that's the one mindset I think most kids don't learn as mm -hmm. they go up to Pee Wees, mm -hmm. through high school, and venture through college, mm -hmm. you know, that one mindset to win, win, win at all costs. Mm -hmm. You know, like when I coach, I tell the kid mm -hmm. all the time too, we're not going to win every game. 
Right, right, right. You learn from the losses mm -hmm. of each game to improve your game, mm -hmm. to make yourself better. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. as a coach and as a psychologist, how do you prepare your players to understand that rule to that you can't win every game, but every game is a learning tool to make mm -hmm. yourself better? Like, how do you post that to help the mm -hmm. kids out better? Well, in terms of that, just like, you know, just – teaching them about win and losses, you know, um, it's okay to want to win, but you're not going to win everything. So they got to understand the concept of winning and trying to win. Winning is great, but striving to win is also better. But knowing with striving to win, you're not going to win every game. You're not going to win every match. So you got to understand, like, it comes with win and losses. And once you get to understand the win and losses, you can go out and give all you can give. But if it's not meant for you to win, you won't win. It's, you're not going to win. That just is just black and white. You know, we can prepare for the best of the best, but if we're not able to execute down the line, we're not going to win. So you explain to them like it's okay to win. I mean, it's okay to lose, but it's great to win. But you're not going to win them all. So you got to get them to understand the difference between winning and losing. But at the grand scheme of things, the approach is that every loss is a win. Cause you can go back and learn from the mistakes, or you can say, "Okay, this is what I could have did better. Or this is what I should have done differently." So, so every win and loss also is a win-win situation. But it's just being able to reach them to get an understanding. Win and losing, you still can come out, you know, being the best you can be as an individual. But as a scribing for winning games, yeah, by all means, that's what you should do. When you play a game, you're scribing to win. You want to win. But on the flip side of that, you're not going to win every match or every game. So just getting them to understand the difference between winning and losing and then helping them understand it's okay to not win at all times. True. That's that's a very good point. The other point that I asked about as to is teamwork. Mm -hmm. Like the importance of teamwork in helping you win. Because like a lot of people, and I know it's not most coaches teach kids and stuff to be individual stats. Or I scored 13 touchdowns by myself. What did the team do? Mm -hmm. Did the offensive line block for you to get that 13 touchdowns? Mm -hmm. Did the offensive line block for you to get that pass, a third pass, 13 touchdowns? You know, because a lot of you notice a lot of kids don't respect certain positions because they're taught each position is less than the other. Mm -hmm. But not mm -hmm. important, not important as the other. Mm -hmm. You know, like when I was going up, I was I was I ain't gonna tell you a story. I ain't the perfect line till one day nobody blocked for me and I almost got killed. Mm -hmm. I understand the purpose of O-line, you mm -hmm. know? Or when I was wondering when my life one time a guy came and saved me, and I ain't still block for me. Mm -hmm. you know? And these kids understand sometimes that you need a team to win games. Mm -hmm. You know, team win games, individual loses games. Yeah. Yeah. That my dad yeah. told me. The entire thing individual in basketball, um, hockey, sport, whatever sport you play in, if you think as individual, you 90% of chance you're going to lose. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The only, even, even down to golf, golf still is a team sport, even though you're out there individually, but you have your caddy and you have your coach. So it's still a team. But but the, the concentration level is slightly different because of knowing the course. But as a, as a team, that's a team that exists with a, with, a golf, uh, with, a, with a golf player at the end of the day. So what I'm just trying to say is, yeah, every sport is based on team-oriented. So you got to be able to understand the goal, set the goal, what's your mission, what's your purpose, and where we're trying to go as a team. Okay, individually, yeah, we are responsible for our certain assignments and also our certain uh, responsibilities and accountability, but all of those should match up with the team because you should have a common goal. So with the team environment, that start that start with the coach. The coach got to be able to produce a team environment with underst understanding the win and losses if the coach is not able to produce a, a winning team environment how can you promote a winning team that is true george hey george Chris, how you doing how are you guys doing how you going brother good 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 doing to yourself good. i told you a lot good. of questions for being here just <laughs> yeah i do i do apologize for coming in late um what did you guys come so far we were talking about mental health. We were talking about team sports, individual health. Take your pick, George. We were talking about every topic, man. We we're hitting them. We were yeah. Okay. 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 Oh, boy. All right. Did you guys talk about combat sports? 
And that's for you, George. I left something for you, George. I left something for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean, look, I definitely appreciate it. It's no coincidence I'm wearing my school T-shirt on the show today. I just got done with testing, so I apologize for being in late. Um, but no I want to talk to you about um, combat sports when it comes to uh, – uh, athletes, because um, football, basketball, they're not supposed to be combat sports. Even American hockey is not supposed to be a combat sport. But when you really have a port sport of kicking and punching and your goal is to do damage, or as they say, they're in the hurt business, how do you help athletes recuperate from that? Like, for instance, I, um, in 2003, when I tried to make the U.S. team to go to South Korea, I didn't make it. And the reason why I didn't make it was um, there was a low blow call. Uh, to one of the fighters hit me in my groin and they wouldn't even give me the full five minutes to recover because the system was kind of like she wanted that particular fighter to go as opposed to me. Now, I kept that in my mind and I was like, you know, um, I don't want to say that I didn't train hard, but I didn't train hard enough. Uh -huh. I didn't know what it was going to be like. It was first time, first time being at nationals. Um, there were a lot of things, but in 2007, I was more determined uh, to not have that happen again. So I trained my butt off. I did doubles. I did, uh, you know, I mean, I probably even overtrained, so you know, because I was so worried about that happening again. And although I made the team, um, there was still something psychologically there with me, whether it was fear, whether it was something else. So how do you help athletes? get over that particular part of it? It's a two-part question. Hmm. Okay. Um, in terms, and I'm going to start, I'm going to start with the, with the coaches first. Like, you know, coaches are responsible to being able to help players fight through, sort through emotions and feelings, but to a certain degree, you know, and then dealing with, dealing with the understanding of what you have to do to make that round or make that match. It had to be a clear goal, and the clear goal have to set in terms of like where are you mentally and where you are physically, like and then having that mm -hmm. goal, as you say, not being able to reach that that um I would say that dream or that desire that you had set out to be um in terms of coming where you are mentally, like how did you sustain that focus? you know um fear could have been also the evidence to why you stay focused to get to that next level. So in terms of having fear, if you can uh, if you can acknowledge that fear and where that fear coming from, you can turn that fear into productivity, into positive energy. So when we have fear, it's a reason why we have fear. So in the fear that you had because you didn't want to miss that round or miss the opportunity, you that fear pushed you and motivated you to be better, to do better. But at the same time, you overtrain yourself, and overtraining yourself can also create a lot of psychological burn burnouts or a breakdown because you're pushing so hard to reach that goal and that fear is motivating you but at the same time you're hurting yourself because you don't want to miss out on the opportunity so so in terms of the of turn in terms of the coaching responsibility the coach could have imposed that pressure on you to allow you to see like you know if you don't reach a certain level or get to a certain um goal or um yeah i would say goal get to a certain goal or a certain measurement to see where you are to reach that level to cross over to get to that that threshold where you're trying to go so with, with with that i'm big on coaches being able to understand the players first but helping the players work through whatever setbacks or challenges or obstacles that they may have in that particular sport so mentally, it's responsible for the coaches as well as the um, athlete, but it have to be some common common ground to say this is where this is where I'm at as a coach expectation and also as a player expectation. So, but you felt the you felt the pressure and the fear that came behind falling short. So you turned that fear into motivation. You turned that fear into pushing you to a level where you felt overtrained. And being overtrained, and like I said before, it can hurt you more than help you. But you was able to endure and push through that that mind. But in the back of your mind, you didn't have that short term memory. You had that long term memory where I don't want to have this feeling again. So you did what you needed to do to succeed in terms of that. I don't know if that answered your question, right. but I just want to. Oh no, it definitely does because I know that um, 
you know, in our sport, there are knockouts and there are severe knockouts, not the technical knockouts. I'm talking about the concussive knockouts where the people are sleeping type of things. And I know that that can be uh, crippling to a lot of different competitors because even though it's an amateur competition, so to speak, it still has a lot of uh, bragging rights. You know, I was a national champ. I went to the world championships and UK mm-hmm. or every two years where they where they host their, their, their world championships. And I know that um, um, during the 2007 event, a fighter from Georgia just came in in the first round, knocked out a fighter from Northern Ireland. I mean, it was clean, smooth. You even hear me on the tape. Oh, he knocked him out, clothes, sleep. You know what I mean? And <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a shock for us because technically in the rules, you're not supposed to draw blood. And technically in the rules, you're not supposed to be aggressive, but a clean kick or clean punch is a clean punch. And if you miss it, the intent is not to knock him out, but if you hit him in that right spot, it can happen. Uh-huh. So that was the shock value. Um, my match when I fame, I was so concerned that I was too cautious, so to speak. So I was fighting for points as opposed to fighting to win the match. You see uh-huh. what I'm saying? So subsequently, yeah. I, I lost by one point uh-huh. because I was fighting for points as opposed to fighting for the match. But saying all that to say, how do you how do you help coaches and fighters get that out of your head, especially if it's, it was a devastating knockout? You know, I mean, back in 2007, there was social media, but there wasn't social media like this where, you know, you get the meme and all the knockouts and this, that, and yeah. third, and just rolling in your head and rolling in your head. And, you know, you have all these things that you can't get past. And the whole world saw you get knocked out and put to sleep and all the pieces that go together. You know, um, how, do, how, do, yeah. how do you get them out of their own head, so to speak? Because... I feel like that can only be detrimental to the athlete or the professional athlete or any athlete whatsoever. Psychologically, I think that it, it could be very uh, uh, terminal, so to speak, because uh-huh. you have to uh, you have to fight that social battle. Even sometimes, uh-huh. if in, in major professional sports, when you see, oh, that's the dude that just got knocked out last week, did you see him on the uh-huh. internet? You know, it just keeps yeah. nagging at you to the point that you just. If you don't have control of your mind, so to speak, or if you don't have a strong team, you know, you can do things like hurt yourself. Or we've seen that, you know, and this yep. is not unique just to amateur sports. I mean, I don't know if you remember, Ronda Rousey almost thought about killing herself when she got knocked out because the exact thing that she said was, wasn't was going to happen, happened. She kicked her in the face mm-hmm. and put her to sleep, you know, mm-hmm. and it's just so it's not just on these levels. There's stages to all this, obviously, but it could turn very uh bad very quick if yep. you don't have somebody to snatch you back into reality and business. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Got a little glitch there, uh coach. But um in, in terms of that, like I just I with what I practice is getting the understanding from the coaches, from individual, like you gotta understand the reason why you're involved with sports. You gotta understand the reason why you're coaching. You gotta right. understand the reason why the rules apply. You got to understand how you're going to operate with certain restriction. And so when you know certain restriction in place, it's going to tamper with your mindsets because you don't want to overstep those boundaries. So you have boundaries in place, but more of a thorough ex- explanation of why you play in this sports, what's the rules and regulation of this guideline. So if, if, if you feel that you just plan to play but at the same time, you're not planning to do your best or be your best because you, you, in your mind, you got the conscious. You already thinking subconsciously, like I know I can't do certain things. So you're hesitant all the time. You, you're cautious all the time. So you can't perform the way that you feel naturally because subconsciously you're worrying about making the wrong hit or making the, the wrong or doing mm-hmm. the wrong kick. Now you now you you calculating. How far I should go? Or how much should I do to stay within that point range? Instead of just feeling comfortable naturally, just to play, because subconsciously you got these restrictions in your mind. So unconsciously you're aware of what's happening in the in the dynamics of the game, but also the subconscious mind is also interfering with the way you process, with the way you want to perform, and the way that you're trying to perform. So subconscious, oh no, you can't do this. Oh no, you 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 have certain restrictions. So you're never going to feel comfortable because you have the restriction and the subconscious mind is constantly telling you that. So guess what? You're trying to push down the subconscious mind while you're trying to focus and concentrate 
on the match at hand. So if you have those uh, restrictions and those uh, boundaries or parameters, you're not going to feel comfortable. You're not going to feel that you're going to do your best, even though you're performing, but you're only performing within a certain restriction. And and I feel like the coaches got to do more, a better job of explaining their sports, no matter what sport it is. You got to give a clear picture, even though you have the clear pictures and the restriction, you still have to reinforce those um, those boundaries and those guidelines but help the player feel free. You're not feeling free. Basically, you're in prison in your own mind because now you calculate right. every move or you're hesitant about every move. But this other guy or this other player may not think the same way you're thinking. And then that's when you can be caught off guard because every move that you're making, guess what? That subconscious mind telling you, hey, George, hey, George, what are you doing? Be careful, you yeah. know, in terms of that. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. That's true. And that's absolutely true because I'm going to go on to test on what you guys are saying also, too. Just some getting knocked out. Like some players now taking bad, massive injuries. Mm-hmm. And some players are lucky to be able to come back, but physically come back, but mentally, they're still not there. Yeah, absolutely. So, mm-hmm. how do you help players get overcome that handicap? I call it a handicap. And now mm-hmm. you handicap yourself to the point, like you say, you restrict yourself. Nobody restricting you but yourself. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not going to run fast as I can because mm-hmm. I, I, I have my knee messed up. Mm-hmm. Or I can't mm-hmm. kick how I want to kind of blew, I blew my knee out last week. Mm-hmm. Or I can't do this. My shoulder went out of place. Now, mm-hmm. how do you help players overcome that mental handicap or mm-hmm. prison to get mm-hmm. themselves at least back to where they used to be at mm-hmm. or better? And, and, and it, it comes with, like, the practice of saying, okay, I understand that I had this injury. But I can't let this injury continue to hold me back, you know, and you got to understand, like, you got to trust the process as in your trainers or your recovery coaching. So you got to see where the players are mentally. A player can tell you they're ready and then they in, in their mind, they may feel ready, but their body not ready. So it's the same concept. So if you if you feel like you're ready physically, but at the same time in your mind, you're not ready mentally, your mind and your physical. So the mind and body got to connect. If the mind and body is not connecting. How can you go out and perform? So when because it's it's a traumatic event, you know, when you blow a knee and then you come back and you feel like you're healthy, you're gonna feel hesitant because you gotta endure mental reps. You gotta endure the the, the conversation of, okay, I know what it takes to get ready. So I, I feel ready, but am I ready? So you gotta test yourself. You gotta you gotta test yourself. And then and that falls on the trainers, that falls on the recovery coaches, the position coaches, and your and your um what you call it, your um your, your team doctors, you know what I mean? Like the team doctors got to be able to give you that measurement to say, okay, I go 100%, but they got to be able to say, okay, you got to know that you're ready to go. Because when, when you say you're ready to go and you're not ready to go, now you're really setting yourself back two steps, you know, before you even came back to saying that I'm ready to go. So in terms of that mentally, you got to do the mental preparation and the mental preparation is saying, okay, I understand that I had this injury. But I got to also understand if I'm still want to perform, I got to trust myself, trust myself, meaning that I'm, I feel good right. or I feel even better to go back and perform. So if you're not trusting yourself physically, how can you trust yourself mentally? So so in terms of saying I'm phys- physically ready, so I got to be mentally ready. So they go hand in hand. Yeah. But it takes a team. You know, it's a team. You know, you have your team doctors, you have your position coaches. Then you have your head coaches. So, but the player got to know within themselves that they're ready to go. You know, if if, if you if you if the mind not matching physically ready, you're not going to be ready. So it's called mental preparation. You know, going out, practicing, running, jumping. You know, you got to feel that comfort. You know, but you, you but at the same time, if you let yourself have negative defeating thoughts or or thoughts of right. rehurting yourself. You already defeated, you know. So you got to trust yourself without with the whole process. But it's a lot of mental rub that comes with that too. That's true. That that is so true. Cause I had a, quite a few. You know, George, can hear you. All right. One last question. Um, oh, there you go. There you go. You say you're saying something. I couldn't hear you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it was okay, go ahead. Finish your thought. Oh, what I was saying. What? Finish I, your thought. I had a mass injury also when I was playing also. Mm. And yeah. I'll tell you, the recovery was like two stages for me. Like one part of me saying, I got this. It ain't no big deal. I can do this. Mm-hmm. 
basically saying, look, but I ain't trying to be funny, but you can't do it. I don't care what the mom is saying. So I had to fight with my body and my mind to get both on one accord. That's why I, said, I relate what you're saying by mm-hmm. being on one accord because those two together, they're like, like the two little bad guys on the side of the head. You can mm-hmm. do it. Oh, you can't. You can do it. And then it's your body doing it. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and a lot mm-hmm. of players that I play with, they come back. Some did come back because the same player, same thing I had in the injury, he didn't come back no more. He quit. He was, he retired. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Mm-hmm. And what I said, I came back within two weeks of getting the injury. The one to 80%. Mm. But it was a mental, mental test. Mm-hmm. I, had to, I had to literally tell myself, it don't hurt. It don't hurt. Mm. It, it really had it would hurt like hell. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Because you have yeah. to tell yourself that. When you have to tell yourself that and remind yourself mentally, you're forcing yourself to say that you're okay when you're not okay. Or, or you, you, you're telling yourself you're okay when you're not 100%. Now, that's, that's uh, more of the will to go, but not being able to understand like you're not ready to go. You know, because that's the competitive nature, right. and the competitive nature can over supersede how you feeling. You know, physically and mentally. But if you constantly remind yourself, "Let's go, let's go, let's go," you already defeated yourself because you're not ready mentally. But you coach your mind to think that you're ready when you're not ready. Yeah. Gotcha. All right, I have a question for you. Um, can you guys hear me? <laughs> it's, it's it's in and out though. It's can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Joy. Yeah. Yeah, I apologize. I'm not sure I was wrong. But anyway, my question is, what if you don't have the money for the coaching staff? What are some tips you can give players, like three or four tips that you can give players to bring them back into that mode of body alignment, physical, mental, and spiritual to play the game? So they, they, you know, in terms of that, can you take it back from the top again? Let me hear the question again. I I heard about the, the mental getting back into a fold but what was the initial? What was the initial question? So I want to make sure I capture that. You said coaches. Right. Well I was now. saying, I was like, what if you don't have the money for the coaching staff? Because you know we were talking about professional and some professional athletes. But what if you don't have the money for the coaching staff from the training coach and the therapist and everything like that? What are some tips you can give, like the amateur player, like three tips that would get them centered back into the space that they need to push on? Now we're talking about injury, post injury, or just in general. Like um, I want to make sure I'm asking you a question. Just in, right. Just just in general. Let's say they just took a loss that they didn't expect to take. Okay. Yeah, in and out. But hopefully you can hear me. So in terms of the win and losses, like the coaches gotta understand well, if you coaching, regardless of what, you you're not gonna get paid a significant amount of money. So just say if the coaches is coaching. The coach has got to be able to break down the win and losses and, and explain to the player that you're going to win some, you're going to lose some. But in terms of, like, giving athletes those pointers or tips, like, the athlete got to understand why they're playing, what's the purpose of why they're playing, and what they're pursuing. You know, in the grand scheme of things, most athletes are playing for the passion, for the love, to earn a scholarship. And that's whatever sport they may play. So in terms of that, the player got to understand why they're playing, what's their purpose, and the reason they're playing. So if they have a clear understanding of their goal to play whatever sport it may be, I don't, I don't really think that it should be much of a uh, a transition to get back in that fold as the mind, body, and the spirit. You know, so it, so like I'm big on understanding your why and why you're trying to play, why you want to play, and what what the end goal would be for you. You know, most players play to earn a scholarship so they can support, uh, to not worry about the family, you know, spending money or sacrificing more. So that helps or in terms of what you're asking for, George, or you want something more defined than that? Right. Absolutely. Yeah, I can't hear you. Absolutely. You can't hear you. Oh, okay. Nope, absolutely. That helps. George? Can you guys hear me? So did I answer your question? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. I'm good. So now, like, I heard like, your answer. I try, I try to be more practical. Yes, you know, you know, I try to be more practical and I try to understand the individual before they the athlete, you know, because what 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 I understood as of being an athlete and as years went along is more mental. 
than physical. You know, in terms of that, right. if you're not mentally ready, how can you be physically ready? You know, and then just coming right. up playing sports all our life, you know, we always talk about macho man, this macho man, that, yep. you know, Iron Man, this Iron Man, that, you know. But as time when I was able to dissect and understand, like, you got to be mentally ready, then physically ready, you know. Um, right. So just in general, I try to help individuals understand themselves first, no matter what talent level they have if you don't understand yourself for for the most part how can you expect yourself to produce and be uh, productive you know so and that's the approach that i try to live by you know on a daily basis with you know individuals clients or athletes understand who you are and where you're trying to go first and what's your purpose and your reason of playing this particular sport so if you're thinking negative, negative going to follow. If you're thinking positive, positive going to follow. If you're an athlete, if you have self-defeated thoughts, you're already defeated before you even touch the field or touch the court, you know. So that self-doubt is what really handicap a lot of uh, right. professionals or amateur or collegiate players, you know. And then even with injuries, you know, if if you have no self-doubts, pre, pre-notion of I can't recover, I'm not comfortable, you know, when you get those indicators, you're not ready to go, and then you push yourself to go, then you re you re injure yourself. Now you're looking at maybe ending your career or a two year uh, window of recovery time. True. I got one more question for you. There's there's also a big topic too: concussions. Mm-hmm. Like, like, how are some ways you can help a player mentally recover from a concussion? Because physically, it's usually not the hard part from a concussion. It uses mm-hmm. the mental part of the concussion. Because they say mm-hmm. sometimes, like Junior say, how a lot of players were saying that it gets them to forget things. I uh, mentioned their memory, the mm-hmm. memory lapse muscles, stuff like that. Now, how do you get a player to retrain in mind mm-hmm. to get back on track after a concussion? Well, you know, with the concussion, it creates uh, loss of memories, loss of concentration, loss of focus, promote aggressive nature, aggressive behavior, violent short-term memory so in terms of that like they're they're starting to develop these uh systems where they can go in and do electrotherapy shock therapy to stimulate the brain it's called rewiring the brain cells like therefore they they pinpoint the deficit in the brain so more in terms of that you got this um it's called talk therapy or psychotherapy you know you you allow them to have the moment of what they feel how they feel and express themselves but when it goes to the electrotherapy, now you got to get connected like a brain map, you know, like you do the EKGs. They yeah. put them on your head like a map and they figure out what's where you may have any deficits or memory losses. So it's, it's a lot of terms of um, preparation, uh, rehearsal. Right. You know, when you have short term memories, you, you got to help the individual build that memory bank back up, you know, and, and, and when it's become too much to the extreme. God bless his soul, but it was too late to help him out because he was already o- over that threshold. And um, he had, I don't know how many concussions, but it only can take one concussion. So you can imagine, you know, one concussion with multiple concussion, it intensify, you know, it causes right. those memories to go less and less, less and less. You know, you can get a concussion easily, you know, if you're not careful, but when you plan such a high compact sport, combative sport, like you say, in, in terms of that, it's constant. And with his position, it was always boom, 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 boom. It may seem like he's okay, but obviously it's called you psych yourself. You know, a lot of times you psych yourself, but you still play through it because you got the drilling and rushing. You can get a concussion and still be able to think you can play it unless you get a concussion that's like a full-blown concussion where you hit someone head on head or someone got a clear cut, a clear hit on you. You know, so it's just preparation, psychotherapy. And then, like I say, with the advancement of technology, they're doing more of the electrotherapy. But it's called like brain mapping and they identify the deficits in the brain and they focus on trying to rewire the brain, uh, replacing old cells with new cells like shock therapy. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Let me know where they can find you on social media. Um, you can call, connect with me at Instagram, Bobby Hallback, and then on Facebook, you can connect with me at Bobby Hallback, and then also on uh, LinkedIn, Bobby Hallback, 
So those are the sources that you can reach me through. Oh, and my Gmail, bobbyhallback at gmail.com also. Yeah. And tell me about that poker game. Mean, you also have an event coming up also that you were talking about earlier. That oh, they oh yeah, up, yeah. Really recently coming up with sports athletes. So we're talking about mental mindsets. Yeah. Um, yeah. On June 26th, uh, next Saturday from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m., uh, it's going to be a dynamic event. Um, these individuals on the panelists are former professional athletes from uh, the NBA, overseas basketball, and also in the NFL. They're going to give you some information based on their upbringing as an athlete and also their transition after sport. It's going to be some dynamic conversations. For instance, I have Quincy Carter, um, Coach Bill Cartwright, uh, Devontae Best, just to name those three guys. So it's going to be a powerful event and groundbreaking and ground shaking, you know, and just helping promote and uh, mental health awareness and just giving everybody the opportunity to say that it's okay to have mental health concerns or mental health illness or mental health disorders. Great, great, great. And I tell everybody else, my famous speech, I already know it. Welcome to our family. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Welcome to Georgia Fraser family. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an sure honor. It's an honor to be text here. Text to that event so we can help promote it as well. Um. So, yeah, let me... Um. I guess, let me see, check and see. Um, I'm, I'm, about to send, I'm about to send, send the link real quick. Nah, oh, we still recording? I'm sorry, I'll wait. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. Yeah. yeah, I was about to send the link to you. Yeah. And you send the email, send, send the emails, whatever, and we have promoted also, so. Okay, okay. Appreciate it, appreciate it. Appreciate you, brother. Yes, sir. Thank you for the time and opportunity. <laughs> Welcome to the show. <laughs> Greatly appreciate it. Uh, Josh. We appreciate you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, man. Good, great show, right, George? <laughs> All right. There's our show. Hey, I would say, this is Frey. Can you hear me, Frey? Now I can, George. I just said, this is Frey. We'll do it again. Let's do it one Have time. a good show, man. It's definitely on good. Listen, check out our show. We've got another great show coming up, too. This is George. Oh, yeah. And that was Real Talk. Hey, it's oh, yeah. And this is Real this Talk is with George. George. And that was Real <laughs> Talk with George and Fraser. We peace.